Dowd. Welcome, Jen Dowd. Uh, thanks so much for being uh, one of our uh, lunchtime speakers. We thought, um, actually, can we see your face for a minute while I talk about you? Oh, yeah, sorry. That's okay. I just want to, uh, we, we don't get to see you after you start showing slides so much. So, uh, uh, Jen, I, would, I thought it'd be a nice break to get some big ideas like we had yesterday uh, in the middle of our kind of formal demography. Uh, and I'm delighted that. Jen was able to, to join us. Um, so I am just uh, delighted to have Jen. Jen was, uh, I first met Jen when I was teaching at Princeton and she was uh, part of our demographic uh, methods, uh, demographic, demographic cohort and I got to teach demographic methods to her. And, you know, they say like when you, when you, you know, try to get a promotion or go up for a tenure or something like that in academia. So you start out in graduate school and you're like a, a junior author to your, uh, to your professor, and then you know to get tenure, like you're a senior author, and you have your student as as a, as, a, as a junior author. Well, then the next stage in life, which I'm enjoying with Jen, is that you know I to some extent I tried to be a mentor to her, and now I'm finding myself uh, that she's being a mentor to me in this in this whole uh, COVID demography thing. So Jen wrote uh, uh, along with some of her collaborators one of the early pieces of, on COVID and demography, published in the National Academy on how demography is really important to, to think about when we're looking at COVID. Uh, you know, very much the inspiration for our first hour on stable population theory and, and crude death rates. And, uh, you know, since I've, since then she has, uh, I've kind of seen her as kind of an evangelist for thinking carefully and scientifically about uh, COVID. And I just wanted to thank her uh, the paper that Tom's going to be presenting tomorrow, uh, I got a lot of useful feedback from her, so I'm going to to my formal former students to try to try to be my mentor. So it's just wonderful to have you. Jen did her PhD at Princeton, then she was a um, Robert Woods Johnson postdoc, great postdoc program, which I don't think has found a replacement yet. She was at Michigan, uh, then she was a professor at CUNY for a few years, and then Oxford made her a deal she couldn't refuse. I don't quite know how they got her. And she's been there for now, what, last three years or so? Um, yeah, actually only like 18 months, but only I was, months. I was but, here uh, at King's College London before that. Okay. <laughs> so thanks so much. Um, and we'll have uh, Jen talk for about 20, 25 minutes and then, or however long she, she planned and then we'll have some discussion and she can stay a couple of minutes longer, but she's in England, so let's not keep her too long. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Let me share my screen now. Okay. Thank you, Josh, for that gracious introduction as well. It is hard, hard to believe how far we go back. And I think our twins were born around the same time as well. So we shared that life course experience. Um, but no, I've appreciated all of your mentorship for many, many years. So I appreciate that. And I wanted to talk today, right, and not in a, a technical talk about specific work, but kind of carrying on, I guess, my evangelism this past year about the role of demography and, and really a population perspective during the COVID pandemic. Um, and in some ways, it was a very personal just experience from starting with that early work last March, which I'll talk about. Um, and has also drawn me into science communication for the first time for more general audiences um, through a social media campaign that I'm a part of, Dear Pandemic, and, and some writing for, for um, the media. And that's just been a real, um, a, you know, a real learning curve for me. It's something I think that we don't typically get trained in um, or think about how to communicate um, more broadly to general audiences. And it's been so important during COVID. And so I want to encourage you all to think about, um, you know, doing that in the future. So um, as you all, you know, kind of remember, if you put yourself back in March of 2020, um, as, as all of this COVID data was coming out fast and furious, um, you know, a lot of us were, were watching early on, not knowing how serious this was going to be. And in fact, one of the early really important questions was how actually dangerous is COVID? You know, is this similar to seasonal flu? Um, and really that question was so important to try to understand, um, you know, the consequences of the, the steps that we were gonna take. You know, should we shut down schools? Should we shut down society? Um, a lot really depended on how, you know, serious and fatal this was. And so some of these very basic questions were, were difficult to answer in the beginning. 
Um, and we were watching it with interest, but we also had a couple of Italian colleagues in our center who had gone back home in February, kind of in, in anticipation of, of these lockdowns and were sending updates. So that was how we, we got interested in starting to look at the data very early on. Um, and so you guys probably looked at a lot of data like this as well. Um, this is in Italian, but on the, the right-hand column are case fatality rates. So um, I'm sure you all know, but these are then confirmed cases um, in the denominator and confirmed uh, deaths due to COVID in the numerator. And this was some of the first data coming out outside of China. So it was really, um, I think we were all waiting to see what this would look like in a different context. Um, and as you can see, these case fatality rates you know, were really high in absolute terms. And of course, we know that we were underestimating the denominator here. But I think the thing that we noted um, quite quickly, and I'm sure you all did too, was the concentration of deaths at older ages. Uh, you can see here that almost all the deaths were above age 60 um, in Italy. And you know, trying to think why was the pandemic hitting Italy so hard at this time, um, I think as demographers, we naturally went to, to the thought that this is you know, one of the oldest populations in the world with, um, you know, after Japan, with 23% of the population above age 65. Um, so this you know, was our you know, kind of light bulb moment, especially at the very beginning of the pandemic, thinking how is this gonna play out across the rest of the world or even within countries um, with different demographics. Um, and so we had this thought, we, we, we wrote a preprint that came out on March 15th, 2020, and we found out on that day that everyone else, you know, every other demographer in the world was, was really thinking the same things, um, that population age structure was gonna be really important here, given the age distribution that we were seeing with COVID deaths so far in Italy. And so our paper um, that Josh mentioned was, was a really simple exercise, just you know, thinking through the implications of this very steep age gradient in mortality for COVID um, and how that might play out in different populations um, with different age, age structures. So we did a couple stylized comparisons, Italy um, and Korea, and so you can, and we used the case fatality rates that were coming out at the time from Italy which were of course very, very high. So that's why these absolute numbers um, look large. Um, and we assumed a 10% prevalence of infection that would be uniform across all ages. So these were very simplified assumptions. And unfortunately, 10% was a very optimistic assumption. But the basic principle is that, you know, you can vary those parameters, but, um, you know, the strong association between age structure and overall mortality uh, remains. And you know, if you look at two countries that have even you know, much different um, age structures, such as Brazil and Nigeria, you see this playing out even more dramatically. Um, and of course, this was before the, the pandemic had, had played out in all of these countries. Um, and, and not to say this is the, the only reason that things have played out differently between Brazil and Nigeria, um, but it probably you know, is, is one important factor. Um, and I won't dwell on that too much because I think you guys have um, kind of internalized the importance of age here. But the other demographic factor that we brought up in our paper was uh, the potential importance of intergenerational co-residence and contact um, that, um, again, some of my Italian colleagues pointed out that with the original infections coming into Milan, this international city, um, a lot of young adults who worked in Milan were commuting out to their villages. Um, and so that there might be, you know, an interaction between an older age structure, but also a high degree of, of intergenerational contact um, that accelerated um, the spread um, into those more vulnerable groups with high mortality. Um, and again, this was just some, some speculation at the time in March. Um, this is um, a little comment from Francesco Valari and colleagues showing the different degrees of daily contact between um, older adults and, and their adult children. So there is quite a lot of variation across different countries. And this has been explored a bit empirically, but I think we're really you know, waiting for some, some micro level data to get a better handle on whether that played out. Um, but we did get some, some press coverage in Italy that was accusing us of blaming the family for all these, um, 
this high mortality levels in Italy. So it struck it struck a chord that we didn't expect um, and has been a bit contentious. But I think um, I think we are getting more data, and this played out a bit in the U.S. Um, in cities um, with immigrant populations. The idea that that multi generational households might be um, an important factor here. And so that was, you know, kind of the beginning of, of my experience thinking about these issues. But um, again, sort of trying to keep abreast of all of the, the news for COVID in the past year as part of my science communication um, campaign meant that I was kind of seeing these connections all the time and how demography, from my view, really remained central to understanding all sorts of different COVID aspects of COVID data as it was coming out. Um, I mentioned that you know something as basic as the infection fatality rate. You know how dangerous is this? Um, is a you know such an important thing to get a handle on, and especially in in making policy and convincing people to take this seriously. Um, and of course, trying to get a handle on that was a real challenge because uh, we didn't know the the true denominator. Um, but then it was also changing over time, and you know some people interpreted that as we're getting better at treating COVID which you know, may have been the case to some degree, but I think we would all immediately think that um, you know, who's in the denominator has probably changed a lot. Um, you know, in the first wave, people weren't prepared for this. We weren't protecting the elderly as much. When we reopened in the summer and, and things shifted, the age distribution of cases had shifted younger and older and more vulnerable people were taking precautions. So, you know, these were things that the media, you know, wasn't necessarily noticing until I think, you know, people in our, with our perspective brought these things up. And identifying that actual infection fatality rate, um, again, was a challenge partially because not many countries, including the U.S., you know, the U.S. actually failed to kind of field um, a population representative survey that would give us a sense of how many people were actually infected. Um, but luckily, some countries did do, you know, uh, population representative seroprevalence studies. Spain did a big one. The UK has been doing ongoing acute um, infection um, test, testing um, every two weeks of a very large sample that's nationally representative um, and also seroprevalence um, to, to see who's been, has evidence of previous infection. And so from that, some, some decent estimates of the actual denominator of infections came out, um, which allowed um, you know, some calculations of the true infection fatality rate. And this is one um, meta-analysis or review that I, I kind of like that, that tried to use the most reliable studies for that. And you can see again, how strongly this infection fatality rate varies by age from 0.4% you know, at age 55 to 15% at age 85. Um, so really, it also points to the fact that a single infection fatality rate is not really a meaningful number, even though, you know, the media kind of wants to say that it's 0.5 or something. It really is not meaningful outside of the context of the age structure of the population and also the age structure of who's getting infected and who's not getting infected uh, within a population. Um, and from these infection fatality rates, um, we were able to take a look at how this does compare to seasonal influenza. So these red lines are some different um, estimates of the IFR based on these seroprevalence studies that I mentioned, and the blue lines um, are seasonal influenza. And you notice that this is on the log scale, so it's actually you know, quite dramatic um, how much more lethal COVID, COVID is than the seasonal flu, even down to, you know, somewhere between ages 20 and, and 30 um, before it kind of ends up you know, being a wash. Um, so something like this, I think, you know, especially there was a lot of politicized rhetoric in many countries about it's really not so bad, it's, it's just a bad flu. Um, and so I think getting these reliable estimates of the actual infection fatality you know, ratio were really important um, and a contribution. And, and we have lots of good memes on Twitter too, um, just to emphasize that that single IFR is, is not necessarily uh, meaningful, that you really need to think about um, the age structure of the population um, that you're applying it to. And um, extending this idea of trying to get a handle on how, how bad COVID was. Um, so this was just a question we got a lot on our, um, our social media campaign 
is, you know, this idea that we were overcounting deaths. Um, and especially there was, you know, some, some politicians suggesting that doctors had an incentive to put COVID on the death certificate. Um, but I think there was also a legitimate question from, you know, lay people that if, if COVID, you know, if, if older people are mostly dying of COVID, you know, might they have died anyway? You know, are we just, are we picking up these COVID deaths, um, you know, from people who would have died anyway, who have other comorbidities, and thus we're really exaggerating the burden of this. I, you know, in some ways, I think that's a really legitimate question. Um, and of course, demographers have a great way to think about that. Um, we know that coding specific causes of death can be tricky and you know one way to to measure these um, mortality shocks is to look at excess mortality um, above and beyond what we would expect from previous years um, and i think you know believe it or not this was actually a, a quite intuitive concept to the general public that you say you know no, we're not you know we're not just counting covid deaths we're looking at how many more people died than we would have expected um, and so all of a sudden you saw these excess mortality figures across lots of different publications like the New York Times and the Economist. Um, and this one I, I liked from last summer in the US, even though it doesn't show what happened later, just because um, this regional breakdown I think showed really clearly, you know, the movement of excess mortality across time and space in, in the US. And I think, you know, one of the things that we're all gonna be trying to figure out for years to come is this breakdown of direct versus indirect excess mortality. Um, and I think, you know, looking at, you know, the differences across time and space and the path of the actual virus um, will be one interesting way um, to try to disentangle that. Um, and as I said, we suddenly were seeing these estimates in all sorts of, um, you know, kind of mainstream publications. So I just, I think it's, um, you know, been really fascinating that a key demographic uh, concept like excess mortality um, has been so so useful and actually intuitive to people to try to um, explain the true burden of mortality. Um, I think it really rings true to a lot of people. Um, so the next area where I think uh, demography has been really important and and Josh is contributing to this. Um, is thinking about vaccination prioritization because, of course, this concentration of, of mortality at older ages, um, you know, means that you know you can probably get a lot of uh, bang for your buck in preventing mortality with vaccines if you um, prioritize, you know, versus age. And this was handled a bit differently where I am in the UK versus the US. Um, the UK proceeded with quite strict um, age prioritization. Um, and still is. Um, so my teenagers have not gotten vaccinated here, even though you know they could have in the US. Um, and this was one of the original figures. I think this was from the first wave in the UK, but you can see that in the UK, the 93% the, um, of deaths were above age 65. I think in the US, that's actually shifted a bit younger. I think it was closer to 80% of deaths have been above age 65. So that is one interesting difference. Um, but this is a list of the, the priority groups for vaccination. Um, and this was grabbed from Twitter, but someone plotted, you know, how many deaths you could prevent then based on um, that, you know, those estimates um, by, by vaccinating a smaller percentage of the population. Um, so, you know, the U.S. had, you know, a much, I guess, less, um, from my point of view, systematic rollout. It kind of um, did try to do some aid prioritization, but it seemed pretty quickly to become a bit of a free for all. So I think that, um, you know, is a debate that probably should have happened much earlier in the pandemic. I think one thing hopefully we'll learn is how to anticipate some of these really important policy questions a little bit sooner. Um, but I think it's uh, been really important that, you know, demographers have weighed in on this. So I know you're I saw this paper on your agenda for later this week, um, but um, Josh and colleagues were, were able to show that, you know, following a, a pretty strict um, age prioritization for vaccinations um, saved, you know, total lives as, as well as um, the most years of life lost. Um, and so I'll let you guys dive into that a bit more this week. But, you know, there has been some, some debate about this. Elizabeth Wrigley Field and colleagues put out an interesting um, paper 
quite recently too, I, well, I don't know how recently, but um, not more than a month or two ago, emphasizing that because of the big race ethnic differences in mortality, um, COVID mortality in the US, um, that you can do a bit better um, in preventing mortality if you kind of combine age and um, geographical targeting of vaccinations. And so I think, again, it might have been too late because I feel like now, you know, the priority is it's probably um, a foregone conclusion, um, but perhaps in, in targeting more direct efforts to get higher take up, um, these, these issues will still be important. Um, and these, if you think about the importance of getting this rollout right, I just, I think we can't underestimate the importance of, of thinking through these issues. And I think demographers were in the best position to do that. And I kind of wish we'd have had more of a role in, in some of the national committees and things about vaccine rollout. Um, because a related issue that was also um, very important was the issue of delaying second doses. And that's something that the UK chose to do. Um, you know, the argument being that the first doses, you know, were not tested um, in the same way. Delaying second doses wasn't explicitly tested in the clinical trials, but there was evidence and also biological plausibility that one dose would be quite protective against um, severe disease and death. So, you know, when there's a shortage and still high transmission getting the most first doses into arms would probably minimize mortality. Um, and so the UK chose that route um, and the US really never seriously entertained that. It definitely was brought up by some people, but it never seemed that um, where the decision-making was happening that that was taken seriously. And having some conversations with colleagues across different disciplines, what really struck me was um, the thinking in the U.S. was very individualistic and clinical, that we can't deviate from the clinical trial. That's what was proven. You know, I can't tell a patient that we're going to delay their second dose past three weeks because um, that's kind of off-label. And it just really struck me that cl some clinicians and bench scientists couldn't see, you know, the, the implications for that population-level policy um, and, and, you know, I'm not saying that one is, you know, that this delayed second doses is definitely right. There was legitimate debate about it, but it really struck me that there was this tension between the individual and population um, perspectives. Um, and I do think it would have been better if more of our, our voices were in those discussions for, for this really important decision. Um, and I'll just say, yeah, I think, um, ooh, let me go back, sorry. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in, you know, because the, the U.S. Uh, mortality level also did stay, you know, elevated quite. So the, the U.K. had a lockdown on top of um, a different vaccine strategy. So it's going to be difficult to make direct comparisons. But I do think we'll be able to look at some counterfactuals of if the, if the U.S. had, you know, had actually chosen some different um, rollout schemes. Because mortality is, is finally coming down, but, it, you know, it was staying over 500 a day. For quite a while, which is is not a trivial um, amount of deaths. So I think that I think that's something we should reflect and, and look back on how that played out. Um, and finally, I just wanted to show a little recent work um, with Ilya, who if he's still here, um, and other colleagues in our center, um, trying to estimate you know the impact of COVID on life expectancy in 2020. Um, as as we tried to, as complete data started to come in um, for some countries. Um, and so we have time, um, you know, for discussion. I'm just going to give you the, the really quick version of these results. Um, we used, yeah, data from um, the human mortality database and for countries that, that had, um, you know, breakdowns by age and sex. Um, and the, you know, the basic um, take home was that, um, you know, there was, you know, quite large um, losses in life expectancy. So the left hand side with the dots are showing the change in 2020 compared to the, the, the lines on the right or the average yearly change from 2015 to 2019. And, and so for females in seven countries and males in 11 countries, the loss was in excess of one year of life expectancy at birth. Um, and this, of course, had not been seen this magnitude of a drop in life expectancy for many countries since World War II or the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, and the biggest losses 
um, of 1.5 years or more, we're seeing um, amongst males in the US, Bulgaria, Poland, and Sweden, and females in the US and Spain. And we also disaggregated <clears throat> or uh, broke down by age and um, the contributions um, to changes in life expectancy at different ages. And um, you know, here, you know, for most countries, um, this was due to losses at older ages. But it is notable that in countries like the US that, that were particularly hard hit um, by overall mortality, mortality um, below age 60 um, was a strong contributor to the losses in life expectancy. Um, and you know, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting work to be done thinking about why the US was hit, um, particularly also at younger ages. Um, and especially ties into some of the recent work on, um, you know, maybe underlying vulnerability of, of the US at middle ages um, and higher mortality overall. Um, so, you know, I think this life expectancy work was also interesting. It's obviously something that we all find, um, I guess not intuitive, but we're quite used to understanding how to interpret life expectancy, but as, as Josh and Ilya know on, on Twitter, we got a little bit of pushback. Well, first of all, there was um, you know, something written by a clinician claiming that the CDC life expectancy um, data was really deceptive and saying that there was a huge fall in life expectancy because he said, you know, COVID doesn't happen every year. So we can't, you know, it's really deceptive to say that this has been a hit to life expectancy. And so some, some people um, tried to explain that that's exactly you know, how life expectancy is calculated. But I think the point remains that it actually is a difficult concept to, to convey to people why, why we think this is um, a good summary measure, even though it's, it's only a period measure. Um, and, and it's true that COVID hopefully is not going to happen every year um, of people's lives. Um, so I think that has made me reflect on, yeah, communication as demographers and how we want to, to think about explaining these key concepts and, and whether we can do better. Um, and so I know Ilya wrote a really good Twitter thread um, explaining, um, you know, breaking down what life expectancy really means. And so I think we can all, um, you know, work harder on, on trying to communicate that. Um, but I, and, you know, substantively, thinking about the future of COVID and population health, I think there's just a really rich research agenda ahead of all of us. Um, you know, we don't know what's gonna happen in 2021, but I think it's obvious there's still gonna be a huge burden um, of mortality in many countries. Um, you know, what happens with vaccines and new variants will, will um, you know, play a big role in how it plays out globally. Um, and then, you know, I think we're gonna start seeing the impact of these indirect effects on health, you know, delayed healthcare seeking, screenings and treatments. Um, I'm quite interested and concerned about longer term um, scarring effects on the population for those who've been seriously ill, um, obviously weighed against some selection effects of, of the, you know, if it's the most frail who have died this year. And then I think many social scientists will be investigating the longer term impacts of the, the social and economic crises and lockdowns associated with the pandemic. So there's a lot, a lot of, of work to still be done. And so this is, I guess, just kind of a pep talk for how you're spending your week um, studying demography, um, that in many ways, demography was you know, really, really important for understanding all aspects of this pandemic. Um, including really important policy decisions in the end. Um, and part of that is because a pandemic is a population problem, um, but a lot of the specialists that we lean on, you know, were trained in a very different way. So doctors, um, you know, really think about patients and individuals and, you know, bench and lab scientists, you know, thank goodness they invented the vaccines, they're amazing, but they do also have a different training and a different perspective. So. Um, I think that's, that's my pitch for the importance of the training that you're getting and that it's okay to weigh in and, you know, give that perspective. It's actually really important, even though some people, you know, call different disciplines out for, for not, you know, that you don't have a right to weigh in on um, immunology or virology. I think um, for a pandemic, you know, we need all these disciplines. And so don't be afraid to um, to, to stay, you know, don't stay in your lane, 
be sure to, to use your voice and it's, it's needed now more than, more than ever. So I'll stop there and would love to hear your thoughts. Okay, you still have 16 more seconds till 2.30, Jen. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Um, you didn't see our other, you haven't seen our two lectures that we already did. You haven't seen the lecture that's coming and yet is somehow you knew what we were going to talk about. So that was just wonderful and that is real context. We, uh, Jen has generously uh, agreed to stay on a few more minutes for questions. So we, I see uh, Jacob, I'll just call on people. Is that okay, Jen? Yeah, please. Or, or you know, put your name in chat if you want me to call on you, Jacob. Hi, um, so um, I wanted to um, uh, ask you if you have any critical perspectives. I'm definitely um, in, in, a, in, a, in a, I'm a similar wavelength as you in terms of really um, thinking, you know, public sociology, doing op-eds, all these things are great, but we also uh, saw a lot of concerns, particularly in the public health community, about um, you know it's it's a classic Bayesian problem. You know you have um, a lack of information um, about a phenomenon, and people want to know, um, as we know since you know Durkheim, uh, about things they don't understand, and they want to not not only know about unknowns but unknown unknowns, and so. I'm wondering how you you um, have experienced that because I know there was like one of the issues is the glacial pace of like peer review, and then you have like public um, uh, health scholars coming out with um, conclusions early on in preprints, and the journalists pounce on it, and a lot of them might regret it later, and yeah. then they get a lot of criticism, and even it can maybe hurt their academic career if they're seen as you know, trying to follow, you know, uh, get the media to pay attention to their work when it may not be like credible. So I, I could talk on and on about this, but I just came, if you can like, you know, be like, but however, you know, and what your experience about that has been. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, it's, it was all kind of a free for all, especially in the beginning, you're right. Um, but I mean, thank goodness for preprints because I think we did need to get a lot of this information out there quickly. And so it's had its pitfalls, but um, I guess I, maybe I'm a little rosy, but I, I felt like um, that the, the immediate peer review, I mean, a lot of it was on Twitter, but elsewhere was, was quite effective that, um, at least in, in quickly showing the, the really bad, bad work. Um, it's true that, you know, I had a lot more experience in how the media picks up things and headlines. Um, and that was one thing that I think became the niche of our, um, our Facebook page and other social media, Dear Pandemic, was being um, a translator of all of that, those headlines. Um, and that was, especially in those early months, that was a lot of what we did was say, you know, this, this headline is a bit exaggerated. Let's look at the actual study um, and give you the real scoop. And so um, I think one of the things that we've realized is there's not really typically a, a, an in-between between the science between the science and the general public. Like it, it might come from the media, but there's no one to interpret the actual media. Um, and so I don't know, we're hoping that that will be that, that will be a niche we can continue going forward. We're hoping to do that for more science and health related stuff um, in the future, but it seemed like a real um, gap that there, and also meeting people where they were on social media was kind of unintentional because we just started answering questions for families and friends. So Facebook made sense, but I think there's something to be said for meeting the public in the place where they are getting a lot of their information. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I mean, a lot of days we get disillusioned by, because of the, the pure volume of the, the misinformation and the myths, but um, we did find that people were quite receptive if you could arm them with some, some tools uh, you know, to debunk things. So it did amaze me that things like explaining that we're not over counting deaths um, you know, people really ran with that and shared it with all their family and friends and their skeptical relatives who were um, claiming that we were overcounting. And, and so um, it did gave, it gave me a little bit of hope and humanity that um, we have to kind of try to flood the landscape with the accurate stuff. Um, 
And I, I think it's worth the trade off that some of the, the stuff that came out quickly in preprints was terrible, but I think at the end of the day, we, we're all able to read it. I don't know. I, I trust our ability to weed through that. Um, That's great, Chandler. We have another question. That was terrific uh, from Jacqueline. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm always a big fan of using like the data that's available and at a time when, um, I don't know, maybe the data wasn't as available, like looking at access mortality, I think is quite interesting, not only because you're able to show that the death was actually much higher than you were estimating, but also it includes more than just death due to um, getting infected with COVID and then dying of that infection, right? It also includes all these like indirect effects, like ways that people get sick and then that could impact it, but also like the whole way that our society changed and how it was organized and the way that also is related to health and death. Um, but I guess the question, and I don't know if you'd wanna answer it or kind of discuss your thoughts on this, but I, I think about like, what does it mean to die of COVID? Like if you had a death of something that wasn't COVID, but would that have happened if the pandemic hadn't happened? Um, you know, for example, like people had limited access to resources. So think about like people in domestic violence situation, homeless people, or people who weren't getting their normal health care, people who had like health conditions that they went go on for too long or not getting dental care. Um, should those be included in how we estimate the impact of the pandemic on health? Um, and where do you draw the line? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... I tend to think we do that the excess mortality, you know, is exactly that counterfactual. It's kind of saying, you know, the counterfactual is what would the world without COVID had looked like, you know, have looked like. And so all of the different pathways that you mentioned, um, you know, people wouldn't have died from those in, in that way um, as measured by excess mortality. So I'm really interested to, to unpack all of that and, like I said, I think it's just, a, it's a bit of an analytical challenge because, um, you know, in places where it was, the pandemic was hitting really hard, like New York City, um, some of it, some of the excess mortality that's not coded as COVID was probably missed COVID cases, but, you know, we don't know how much was people staying away from the hospitals um, and dying at home and all of the other things that you mentioned. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that there, you know, there will be over time, but, you know, for a while lockdowns were quite uniform, you know, in those early days, a lot of places had restrictions and um, canceled appointments and things that um, I think might give us some leverage on, you know, places where the transmission actually wasn't high, but restrictions were in place where we can kind of tease out some of those direct versus indirect effects. And I guess the more cause of death data that we get. Um, I know here in the UK, some of the external causes take quite a while to get registered. So I've seen some estimates in the US, but I don't know how complete that data is. But I think it'll be really important to try to look at all of those other external causes. Um, but in my mind, that all is due to the pandemic. Um, so, you know, I guess if you're in a biological sense trying, trying to identify who specifically died of COVID and, and how fatal it was, that's one thing. But um, clearly the counterfactual is, you know, yeah, what, what did COVID do to, to mortality overall? So to me, that's, it's fair to count all of those deaths. Jen, can I ask one more question? Yeah, please. A little bit different angle here. Um, so you're giving advice to an assistant professor or a graduate student who is thinking of writing a COVID paper. To, to my mind, uh, <clears throat> this has kind of changed a little bit the way we think about what we're doing. We're really tempted to try to publish a paper that will make a difference, but the huge wave of COVID papers means that most of it's just gonna get washed away. You'll have difficulty getting reviewed. You may, make, you may get some press coverage, but you know, you may not even get published. Uh, the pandemic is changing. Um, so that's kind of the negative side of it. The positive side of this super interesting issue. I, mean, I, I guess to me, this is a somewhat scary issue to be researching in if your career is on the line, particularly as a, like a social science demographer or something like that, because you, you, you might make a huge impact 
but it, it's such a such a noisy, full, wavy zone. So I just kind of you've been kind of doing this public science stuff, but you're also trying to publish your own articles. So I'm sure maybe you could just give your personal opinion yeah. about what you choose to kind of invest time in kind of uh, on this topic. Yeah, that's that's great. And the balance, um, I think, shifted over the pandemic. You're right. Like very early on, there was not much in the space, like, you know, super early in March 2020. So I think anything, you know, had a had a pretty big impact. Um, but you're you're completely right that things have gotten flooded and difficult to review. Um, and so I think my own shift, so my own work shifted a bit more towards the public communication, which just seemed more immediate um, and conveying, conveying these, all of these insights in, in plain language, like a lot of it could have been written up, I guess, as, as papers, not a lot of it, but um, I guess I started erring on just getting the communication out there. Um, and not necessarily putting everything into a, a preprint like some people did. Um, and just the stakes started to seem really high to have these public conversations rather than in academic papers. So I didn't cover it in this, but if you guys remember the Great Barrington Declaration that came out in October, um, and that idea was that if we had focus protection, they quote focus protection of the elderly, we could kind of let everyone else um, go about their business and be done with this all in you know six to eight weeks from from getting herd immunity. Um, and there were you know a lot of empirical claims in that type of idea um, that nobody really worked out, like that I thought merited real academic discussion. But in some ways, there wasn't time for that, and um, it became you know exchanges in you know, not, not very academic like exchanges with looking at real data. Um, and so in some ways that was frustrating, but if I had, if we had tried to publish papers to rebut them, it would have been, yeah, like five months too late by the time that came out. Um, so, so there was, so I was one of the authors of the John Snow memorandum that did try to rebut that, but it was, that's much more of kind of an opinion type of piece than an academic piece. So um, to me, a lot of it felt urgent on a daily basis, which is not that conducive to the academic timeline. Um, so, um, but going forward, I think, even though the, it might seem like a flooded area right now, some of these areas that I outlined about the long-term effects on population health and mortality and social and economic well-being, you know, I think will be important areas and plenty of room to carve out really meaningful agendas. So. I wouldn't be afraid of, of doing COVID work now, but you can be much more deliberate, I think, about it now. I hope. <laughs> okay, we're getting, we're, the, the, the chat room is alive with one last question. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna read it to be quick. It's about how, what's your advice for communicating uncertainty well with the public? Science is about communicating uncertainty and thank you for your great talk. Wow. Yeah, no, you're reading my mind if I had to, talk about the challenges um, in Dear Pandemic. Um, we've been trying to reflect on this. And, and again, we were doing this all on the fly. So, um, but, but, but you really nailed it. Like we, so we have this question box, it's called Dear Pandemic, because people like Dear Abby, people ask us questions. And so many people want you to tell them that something is safe or unsafe. Like I want to do this, you know, or this, is it safe? And so, most of what we've been trying to communicate is kind of the idea of risk as a continuum and the idea of, of uncertainty. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, that we have like the pedagogy down, you know, perfectly, but we do a lot of um, scenarios and examples um, is one way people kind of like you to be very, very specific. Um, We've learned that people really can't generalize that easily. So if you say that a mask is effective, you know, at preventing transmission or you know, you should wear a mask, people will say, well, you know, I have a big nose and you know, what about my glasses and you know, what fabric? And so um, it's been amazing um, to see how I think being more specific and and um, simplifying things with actual specific scenarios. Um, is really helpful and, you know, trying to, um, you know, write as if you're explaining it to your 
grandmother, I would say. So the, the real challenge for us was learning plain language because that's not something we're taught very well in academia. Um, but I think it's, it's really, really useful for clarifying the concepts too. Um, but I think I'm still learning every day how to communicate uncertainty. It's, it's, a, real, it's a real challenge. Um, but some of the things around vaccine safety, I think we've, we've done a lot of that. So um, one of the most difficult things was trying to explain to people that, you know, if we start vaccinating millions of people, um, a certain number are gonna have heart attacks or die the next day just by chance. Um, so we tried to explain that, you know, kind of upfront before vaccines rolled out. And then when the AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson blood clot thing happened, it was tricky because we'd spent a lot of time telling people, don't worry about that. It has to be, you know, above a base rate for us to be concerned. Um, and then it was really tricky to try to interpret, you know, there does look like there's some safety signal here, but it's still very rare. How do you compare it to other risks? Um, but, um, you know, trying to put that in context of other risks that people might take is, is one thing that we try to do. Um, but it's, it's not easy, not easy at all. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, let's join, uh, you can do virtual applause or uh, unmute and give actual applause. Thank you so much, Jen. Thanks, really guys. Um, good, to uh, good luck in, in your future evangelizing your yeah. communication with, with the public and also with your science. Okay. Uh, great yeah. stuff on all, on all ends. It was just wonderful to, to have you. You gave a lot of uh, context that I think was much needed for, for the workshop. And also we loved hearing uh, your, your personal takes on so much of this. So thanks again. Um, Can you share your Twitter handle? Oh, sure. Yeah. Can you sh share your Twitter? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so we are um, we've, 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 we're in the middle of our lunch break, but I would suggest that we actually, since we're gonna go a little bit late, there's no reason for us to start brutally on time. Let's begin at 1.15. So we're gonna begin 15 minutes late and um, I'm gonna go for a little walk, but I'll probably be back here at one. So I can tell people we're not gonna start till 1.15, don't worry, but maybe you can blast out. Um, uh, maybe uh, Elizabeth, could you maybe do that or Pyle? Uh, blast out on B courses, just saying we're starting at 115 for those of people who've gone away already. Yeah. Um, and uh, see you soon, Jen. Bye. Take care. Bye. -bye. Guys. <clears throat> so have a good lunch, everyone, and, and see you back here at 115. <laughs>